Hello, my friend. Hello, Candace. How you doing? I'm doing. We're live. So, so can, election, election. election. No, no election. No, no, no talking on that. Um, can no. you please uh, look in the participants and let in? Um, I have Sydney and Larry in the waiting room. Yeah. So um, the Eisenhower Sleep Center. Uh, is in. I okay. just have another two people that I don't know who they are. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So. Which one do you want me to make the co-host? Eisenhower and uh, Brett? Yeah, you can make me a co-host and then if you'll make... Um, I make both already. Yeah, perfect, there we go. I wasn't showing anybody in the waiting room. That was kind of weird. Okay. Yeah, perfect. And then we have... Um, da, da, da. So this is Dr. Shurkin. This is Candace, which you've met, I think, before. Guillermo, you may have not met. He's... Uh, how are you? The program side at the LGBT Center. And then, and then uh, Guillermo, I don't know if you saw my email. I just sent it a few I'm working, ago. I'm working on that right now. I'm going okay. to and if not, I have mine room. here, but uh, I just figured that would nope. be the one with the LGBT Center. I'm on it. LGBTQ Center. Yes. Yeah, and then we'll have, as I said, we had 27 people registered on our side. And you guys had another 11 or 12, so. So we shall see how many of the four. <laughs> yeah, how many people are not. <laughs> yeah, how many people are, are not watching TV or going crazy with all the other stuff? Or maybe asleep? <laughs> well, I, I know we won't hear about Nevada until tomorrow, so that's what they said. Yeah, minimum. I think that was, or yeah, they said something about it. We need those six polls. Yeah. Yes, and tonight. Arizona has eleven, so and we should hear that tonight. So. Well, Arizona, they keep depending on who you, which station you look at, they're like, yeah. oh, "You won." I didn't win any. Well, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't trust any of it. And the pollsters. Well, they not... have uh, Maricopa County the Attorney General or somebody was just on TV, and so there's a lot of votes out. So we'll see. They should have them by ten o'clock. Yeah. So lots of anxiety for people, but calm. <laughs> My hair is doing something funky. Yeah, you're always gonna kill me. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Dr. Shurkin, are you sitting how you're gonna sit? Yeah, you are. All right, so I'm gonna. Can I support? You know, it's funny. I don't know that I need the blocks. <laughs> oh, that's better. Yeah. We just send a message to everybody in the waiting room. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> we have only three people in the waiting room right now. Oh, well, that's good because they're very early. Yeah. Most people don't join until right at the hour. Um, now, do you guys do webinar format? You don't have a webinar account. Is that right? Candace? No. Yeah. No, we don't. No. Should you decide I, to go, go that I direction? Do, it's totally I do different. Google Teams <laughs> with Sage. Yeah. Well, should you need to use one, we have one, so we can always, if you need to. Yeah, but it's completely a different, uh, a different set of. So I'm not going to say that we're going to open the microphones for questions that's warranted because we don't do that. <laughs> I'll just talk about the chat. Yeah. Do I not field questions? Yeah, you will field questions um, at but the end. Is that the most appropriate, Doctor? What was that at the end? At the end, is that most okay? And then what we do is we take questions during the chat. Um, and then we, at the end, we say, you know, we can unmute you, you know, if you have a specific, you know, we either raise your hand through the Zoom, um, there's a reaction piece, and or put it in the chat, and then I will, or Candace will relay those messages to you, and then if they don't want to speak, and then we ask people to unmute if they want to actually address you with a question. 
Yeah, and a lot of times there's just a natural pause and there might be something in the chat that pertains to what you're talking about there. Yep. So we might interject one there <laughs> for you that, we, that we're reading in the chat, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. So how's everybody look from your end? Oh, I keep yelling. That's so good. I have to turn my video off. <laughs> okay, we have seven people on the waiting room so far. Okay. That's an appropriate topic for an appropriate day. Eight people. Wow, eight people already joined and we have six minutes to go. Yeah. You might, you might hold the record, Doctor. <laughs> For what? Number of attendance. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Have waiting. Yeah. There we have 40. Four. Some registered. You had actually more people registered now for yours than we've had anybody. You oh, beat wow. Out, beat out yeah. orthopedics, Dr. Feldman. No pressure. <laughs> I beat out orthopedics and Dr. Feldman. Or Dr. Or Feldman, yeah, from, yeah. From cardiology. From car I mean, uh, cardiology and orthopedics. Wow. <laughs> Dr. Feldman has 42 that registered and then about 30 some that showed up. Well, do they tend to show up right at the very end, like right at the start time? Yeah, no, normally everybody's always in a waiting room. So until the hour, you know, literally hits at the time, then it, uh, people aren't allowed in. So they just get used to not showing up until that moment. I see. But it's always strange. I mean, as I said, we have so many people registered, but, you know, you never honestly know what they're doing. Well, it'll be curious what the election maybe people are more focused on that yeah, yeah. It could be. i think they're more focused on your topic that's why we're gonna have a good <laughs> turnout. Okay. how often do you guys do these this, this is, is number four, four. today <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for but, today yeah. but that's what that's what brett does as far as the center and doing it we do them twice a month yeah oh wow but it's brett's life <laughs> yeah at the moment it's uh, we had a senior center this morning um lgbc center tonight which senior center uh, palm oh. desert it's actually it's a combination of palm desert uh indio and cathedral city Okay. We do a lecture series with them on uh, two times oh, a month, at 10 a.m. But um, yeah, so we were meeting with them today, and then, uh, and but it's predominantly Jocelyn Senior Center in Palm Desert. Yeah, because I do the Aging Mastery series. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and they're kicking that back up in gear, so yeah. that's yeah. Coming. We did the first Zoom one a couple weeks ago. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, so they're, um, he was just talking about that today, and they're trying to expand that into if we had anybody really working on brain health, it's just hard, you know, we just don't really. You know, when they had the wellness center over at Arduous. Yeah. Yeah, and so now we're, we're not I'm trying to find some new topics and new things. Okay, I have to stop yawning. I'm definitely going to put turn my video off once I get going because it's the last thing I want to do. Yeah, you're, you're making, making it contagious. I know, I know. This is not a... Well, it's only Wednesday, but it seems like it should be Friday. It's a long week. <laughs> well, I think with the time change and it's dark early. And the election and staying up late and trying to... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, all of it. Yeah. I'm getting up early. The stress of the election, for sure. People don't, aren't sleeping well. We have a minute and a half. So, and we have 12 people in the waiting room.
Uh oh, here comes the other one. Oh my goodness. So who's um who's gonna do the introduction first? Is that you, Candace? Yeah, I'll do an introduction to the whole series and then I turn it over to Brett and Brett will introduce you. Okay. And then you can continue to say anything that Brett left out. <laughs> Should I mute while you're talking, Brett? Will there be feedback? Yeah, there will be. So um, from YouTube probably, yeah. That would be helpful. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll mute now. <clears throat> Okay, I'm letting people in. Okay, okay. Give me the high sign when you want me to start, Gemma. Soundhub signing off. Okay, Candace. Hi, and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Candace Nichols, and I'm the director of programs at the LGBT Community Center of the Desert. And welcome to Eisenhower Health and the Center's um, Health and Wellness Lecture Series. Um, if you're here for the first time, these will be new housekeeping rules that I'm going over. Um, and otherwise, if you've been here before, you've heard them before. So I'll just bear with me as I repeat them. So um, all your audios will be muted once um, you're admitted into the video call and we will open the microphone at the end for questions. In the meantime, if you do have a question, please use the chat feature. You can type in and um, if appropriate, we can um, ask the question of the speaker while we're going, or we will ask those questions at the end, or you can ask them yourself. Um, so please turn on your video uh, so that we can see your smiling faces and welcome you to our Zoom family. So please be advised that this meeting will be recorded for future use on both the Eisenhower and the center's uh, websites. Um, and you can see it again for your own convenience or send it to someone. Uh, so by continuing in the, in the meeting, you are um, consenting to be recorded this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Brett Klein who uh, will introduce our speaker for the evening. Great, thank you, Candace and Helen. Welcome. Brett, you're muted. Oh, sorry, I am muted. It was showing that I was unmuted, how strange. In any case, hello everybody, Brett Klein with Eisenhower Health and um, I'm here to uh, welcome you um, for our um, monthly and uh, I guess almost every two weeks Zoom lecture series with the LGBTQ Community Center of the Desert. I'm proud and honored tonight to um, present um, Dr. Taylin uh, Shurikian from our Sleep Center and she'll give you more about her credentials and our sleep center, um, but I personally know about it because uh, I've had a gone through it, and I can't say enough about it. And I'm uh, always excited to hear her her talk. And I think it's a perfect lecture topic for tonight, especially with everything going on in the world around us and sleep patterns changing and time zones and anxiety. So with that and no further ado, I will pass it to um, the doctor to introduce herself fully, and then. Um, uh, Dr. Trukin, you can share your screen and Guillermo will unshare that. There we go. Good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Have 
does one participant can share at a time. You should be the only one there sharing at this point. Is that working now? Yeah, that's sure. Your mouse is going to get that. <laughs> Okay. Now, am I supposed to see myself? Yeah, you're not seeing you. I see you and you look great. Okay, and you guys can see my screen. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. All right. So this is our topic for tonight. Um, I have uh, a lecture that I do quite frequently and it, it really is quite adaptable to, you know, most topics with sleep. Um, and, you know, essentially it, uh, I go over um, an introduction to sleep and understanding sleep, um, how sleep helps us, why we sleep um, and what we can do to improve our sleep. So I like this little screen here. Um, because it shows some real fun ways that people sleep, um, not always in the most traditional sense of the standard bed in the bedroom, um, sometimes in glass boxes over the um, mountains of Machu Picchu or in a sleep box um, in Japan or maybe under the ocean or in an igloo. So um, what we know about sleep um, is really based on um, through the evolution of sleep studies, which really were invented um, back in the 1950s. So sleep medicine is actually a relatively new field of medicine compared to our counterparts. Um, and there was a Dr. Berger who back in the 1920s um, had originally invented the EEG, which then until the 1950s was not evolved into then the study of sleep. And I like this little cartoon because I imagine that this is what most of my patients think of in their mind when I tell them that they're going to do a sleep study um, hooked up to, you know, all these wires and leads and that once we do that, that we tell them, okay, now go ahead and try to sleep and they think to themselves, well, how the heck am I going to be able to sleep hooked up to all these wires. But in reality, this is more of uh, what it looks like. These are just some stock photos that I pulled off the internet um, and in the the picture kind of up at the top is showing the standard um, electrodes and leads that are um, applied to the scalp and the face and um, the belt across the chest to look at your breathing efforts, um, the finger probe to monitor the oxygen. And then in the picture down at the bottom is showing actually with the CPAP therapy, which is the continuous positive airway pressure um, with the mask. So it, it doesn't look as horrible as that cartoon does. Um, and there are also um, options for what we call home sleep tests, um, which uh, here are some examples. Um, and this gives you an idea of how much easier it might be to do a home sleep test in some cases, um, maybe based on your insurance or depending on your situation, this may be a more appropriate um, approach. So what is sleep? Um, it's, it's a reversible state as opposed to, for example, um, a coma, um, where we um, basically have a decreased responsiveness to the environment around us, um, but during which time um, our brain is actually very active. So if you were to observe someone um, sleeping, um, usually they'd be lying down in a recumbent position. Um, they're not as responsive to their environments. Um, their eyes are closed and usually their breathing is slow and regular. Um, but the brain is actually um, cycling through um, different stages of sleep. And as I mentioned back in the 1950s, when they first started to um, study sleep, uh, they were able to distinguish um, at the time, they actually uh, had five stages of sleep, but they now have condensed it down to four stages. Um, and your stage one is really your transition into sleep from wakefulness and it usually should be around 5% or less of your overall night. And then stage two um, is about 45% and then you go into your stage three and, and then REM sleep. And between stage three and REM sleep, um, 
it constitutes about 50% of your overall night. Um, and here are just some depictions of how we characterize these different stages of sleep. And it really has to do with those brain waves um, and the frequency of those brain waves. And as we are awake and become relaxed and start to doze off, get into stage one, stage two, and then you can see stage three sleep, um, the brain waves um, slow down and spread out. And then during REM sleep there at the bottom, you can see that the brainwave activity is actually somewhat similar to um, relaxed wakefulness. And they've actually determined that um, during REM sleep, you burn more calories than you do sitting quietly um, in a chair with your eyes closed. And here is um, a snippet from a sleep study showing the characteristic eye movements that we see in REM sleep, which REM stands for rapid eye movement. So those blue um, squiggly marks at the very top um, are those rapid eye movements that we see. And here is showing um, how essentially every 90 to 110, 120 minutes, um, we cycle through these different stages of sleep. So typically once someone falls asleep, their first REM cycle will occur right around 90 minutes um, to 120 minutes. And then we kind of basically start the um, cycle back over again. And during different stages of sleep, um, they're beneficial for um, different functions. Um, but for the most part, all stages are um, restorative. Some might be more restorative for the brain, whereas other stages may be more restorative um, for the muscles and um, other organ systems. And here is showing what we call a hypnogram, which is basically looking at um, over the night for the duration of one's sleep, how you cycle through the different stages. Um, and typically in the first half of the night, our stage three or what we call slow wave deep sleep predominates whereas in the second half of the night, our um, REM sleep um, is more prominent. So um, the interesting thing about um, sleep is that it helps us um, not only to feel rested, but it helps to lock in um, what you've learned that day and helps to preserve what are important memories to keep versus removing essentially the trash that we don't need to retain. And it helps to keep our chronology straight. So it helps you remember at what time of the day did you have lunch, when you went to go see the movie. Um, it keeps everything in line. And this here is um, a little schematic showing um, that one thing that they've discovered about um, our sleep is that it's um, also important to, as I mentioned about clearing out the trash, is that not just from a figurative standpoint of determining what information is important to keep, but when we sleep, they have also determined that we do clear out um, byproducts of energy. So when we're awake and we're busy using our brains, we um, use up energy and then those products um, build up in our brain tissue. And if we don't sleep well and if we don't sleep enough, then we don't clear out that byproduct. And then it essentially will accumulate. Um, and that is basically part of the theory behind the beta amyloid pl plaques that are responsible for um, Alzheimer's disease. So this is just another a picture showing how um, those little um, gle glial cells or those um, brain cells that you see that are depicted like in the purple there, that when we sleep, they actually shrink down in size. And then that allows improvement of blood flow through the brain tissue, which then clears away all of those little waste products, which are the little black dots that you see there. And then they get absorbed into the venous system and then are cleared through the body out of the brain. Um, so that being said, um, what are some things that help to um, control our sleep? Um, we have two main processes. There's the circadian rhythm and then um, your sleep pressure. Um, the circadian rhythm is basically an internal clock um, that for the most part is something that is innate in our, in our brain, um, but it is controlled um, 
essentially by uh, our exposure to sunlight um, and uh, the production of melatonin. Then there is sleep pressure, which is a physiologic function um, similar to, for example, thirst and hunger. The more you go without drinking fluids or the more you go without eating, then the thirstier or hungrier you are. So with sleep pressure, the more you go um, staying awake, then the more you build up that pressure or desire to want to sleep. So as long as both of those are in sync, um, most people tend to do well with their sleep cycle. <laughs> And one of the interesting concepts is that um, our circadian rhythm is actually um, technically on a 25 hour cycle, which is more consistent with um, the cycle on the moon versus a 24 hour cycle. But because of what we call entrainment, we actually adapt ourselves to a 24 hour cycle. So this here is showing um, up at the very top um, over a week or 10 day period, um, somebody who is entrained. So they're in their normal routine exposed to um, sunrise, sunset, alarm clocks, meal times, um, work schedules, school schedules, and whatnot. And so they're in a, in a set schedule. Then if you were to take them and put them in an environment where they don't have exposure to any of those cues, um, and they were allowed to just essentially run free, um, you would see that their circadian rhythm shifts by literally one hour um, per day, which is consistent with a 25 hour cycle. And then at the very bottom there on day 35 um, and on, they are put back into um, an environment with those natural uh, cues that then put them back into that 24 hour cycle. So this um, cartoon is funny um, because even though it's an old cartoon, uh, it, it tends to relate to even modern times that Many of us are very busy, um, lead very busy lives, and um, there are a lot of disruptions that interfere with our ability um, to um, not only make time for sleep, but to sleep in, a, in a, an environment that's conducive to, to proper sleep. So what are some of the things that affect our sleep? Um, as I mentioned, um, alluded to in a previous slide, melatonin. So our exposure to the sunlight suppresses uh, the production of melatonin. As the sun goes down, then that chemical is produced in our brain and it helps us to feel sleepy um, and helps us to transition to go to bed. Um, exercise um, in, in line with that idea of the physiologic sleep drive that as you, um, if you exercise regularly, um, that helps to build up um, your desire for sleep in the evening. Um, traveling across time zones, um, obviously that can cause jet lag. So your circadian rhythm might be used to one time zone. And if you travel to another, um, then that can affect your ability to sleep. Individuals who um, have irregular shift works where uh, they may work the night shift and then the next week they're working during the day or then they might be working a modified night shift um, that can really affect their ability to you know obviously have consistency um, in their sleep uh, schedule and then medical problems tend to be quite an interference um, for people especially with pain um, women when they go through pregnancy or menopause that can um, have a huge impact on their ability to sleep so napping um, is uh, an important thing to keep in mind in terms of how this affects your sleep at night. Um, so kind of going back to the idea of our uh, sleep cycling through the different stages every um, 90 um, minutes to 120 minutes. So you can um, also relate this to naps. So typically if someone takes a 10 to 20 minute nap, which they may refer to as a cat nap, it usually is quite refreshing. Um, and typically you will stay in that um, stage one and stage two sleep. Um, but if you sleep longer and you get into a 30, 60 minute nap, you likely are getting into your slow wave sleep. And if you wake up out of that stage of sleep, as if you remember from those brain waves, they're very, um, you know, large and spread out um, 
brain waves. So you're in a deep sleep and you'll have a lot of what we call sleep inertia and that you'll wake up feeling groggy. And you know, sometimes people say that they feel worse when they take a nap um, afterwards um, and that they'll have a headache and not feel well. And that's usually because they've woken up from that deep sleep and their brain is actually wanting to sleep longer and, and to get into a REM cycle, um, which if you were to sleep into 90 minutes or longer, you'll definitely achieve um, a REM cycle. And a longer nap can be beneficial for someone, let's say a college student who's maybe cramming for exams, um, has been staying up late, needs to sleep before their test. Um, and if they were to sleep through a full cycle, um, that can help um, in terms of their memory retention. <laughs> Um, and here is showing that, um, again, that concept of melatonin, how as our society has evolved over time and our exposure to electronics, that we are exposed more and more to that bright blue light, which is on the left-hand um, side of this um, slide. And that due to that exposure, um, it's depressing our melatonin. So those who tend to um, sit in bed on their smartphones, and especially if they're not dimming the screen, um, they don't realize that they are actually suppressing their melatonin. So then it's making it harder for them to feel sleepy and to want to go to sleep. And then when they do finally shut it off, there's a delay in their melatonin expression and so that then uh, by the time they sleep and then have to wake up, let's say maybe six hours later, um, they may then feel like a hangover effect or groggy, not just because they didn't get enough sleep, but because also the melatonin hasn't finished running its cycle. So there are some things that you can do to counteract that if you have to be on an electronic device later in the evening. Um, they usually recommend to to minimize exposure at least 30 minutes before bedtime. And some even say starting around nine o'clock in the evening to try to minimize um, use of electronic devices. Uh, but you can uh, use red filters. There are glasses that you can wear or you can adjust the background screen on your computer. Um, for example, um, Google Night. Um, so the Google browser has the Google Night as an option and that reverses the brightness. <laughs> And then um, there are some other tactics that are really important to keep in mind, um, especially during stressful times. And if uh, you're going through um, any, um, you know, a difficult period, grieving, maybe a new transition with uh, work or school, um, that certain things can help to maintain good sleep. And so um, keeping a good routine both with your, your sleep schedule and also your daily routine and making sure that your room is always quiet, dark um, and on the cool side. Um, and the important thing about the temperature being cool is that our body actually drops its core temperature by one degree. And if we're not able to do that, then it's difficult to get into deep sleep and your sleep will become uh, more fragmented and light. Uh, and so by dropping the temperature in the room, allows your body to give off that, that extra degree um, that it has to release. Um, exercise, as I mentioned before, is important um, in terms of helping you build up your sleep pressure um, through the day. Um, and then also keeping um, your bed basically for sleep and intimacy. Um, I always give the example of a patient of mine who during the summertime, it was very costly for her to um, keep her house cool. So she would um, confine herself to her bedroom. And so she would watch TV in bed. She would get her mail and open up her mail while in bed, talk on the phone, work on her computer and just basically spent, you know, if she was in her house, she was in her bedroom and in her bed and, you know, in particular. And so then when it was time for bed, um, essentially she, you know, had created this um, mixed signal to her body as to what her bed was for. And so then she started to develop insomnia symptoms. <laughs> So essentially, our sleep robbers are the behaviors that disrupt our um, ability to sleep and essentially counteracting all of those tips that I just mentioned. So somebody who has an irregular um, work schedule, um, who's not keeping a regular sleep routine, um, alcohol um, can affect your sleep. And in particular, if you're drinking close to bedtime, they actually recommend that you 
try to refrain or finish drinking um, at least four hours prior to bedtime um, so that your body has had a chance to metabolize the majority of the alcohol. Initially, alcohol will have a sedative effect and sometimes people will you know, drink alcohol to help them get drowsy and make it easier to fall asleep. But unfortunately, as your body is metabolizing it and you know, essentially withdrawing, so to speak, you can then um, experience fragmented sleep from that point on. So it actually, um, maybe in the initial part of your sleep, it may seem like it's helpful, but then it will tend to be more disruptive. Um, caffeine uh, obviously is a stimulant. So, um, you know, any kind of product like caffeine, nicotine, if you're, um, you know, using those products um, in the later afternoon can affect your ability to sleep at night. Uh, some studies have even found that those who drink um, significant amounts of caffeine throughout the day, even if they may kind of cut themselves off, let's say around three o'clock in the afternoon, um, but because they drink so much throughout the day that um, studies have found that they tend to have less deep sleep um, than someone who may only have a couple of cups of coffee in the morning. So, um, for some of my patients who may be struggling with insomnia, we really um, try to figure out how much caffeine they're drinking and at what point are they cutting themselves off. Um, usually we recommend to, to stop caffeine around um, three, four o'clock in the afternoon and for some individuals even sooner. Um, so worrying is also a, a big contributor to um, insomnia symptoms and difficulty sleeping. So I talk to my patients uh, that, you know, obviously seeking out help if there is a particular issue that they're struggling through, if they need to see um, a therapist, um, but sometimes they can do other tactics even just on their own, like having a worry journal or a gratitude journal, um, having a to-do list. Uh, many times people who are type A personalities, they tend to, um, you know, think about all the things that they have to accomplish the next day. And obviously when you're sleeping, you can't, um, you know, take care of those things and you need to focus on being able to sleep. So if you have a, um, a list, um, a notebook that you can write in, write everything down so that then you can tell yourself, okay, you have your list, you have yourself organized for the next day, you know what you're going to tackle the next day. And you've kind of given yourself a plan that you've solved the issue so that then you can put that aside and, and um, be able to go to sleep. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of those other topics here I've um, already gone over. Um, so why do we care so much about sleep? Um, most, for most people, it's pretty intuitive. You, you yourself know that if you're not getting sufficient sleep, you may feel irritable, you have a difficult time concentrating, um, multitasking, um, you may not be making, you know, good judgment. Um, but even if somebody, um, let's say, is is not sleeping consistently, um, you know, they've 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 done studies and there have even um, been situations where people have tried to do fundraisers where you know they try to see who can stay awake the longest. And at a certain point, it actually can be um, quite detrimental. Um, people can actually start hallucinating. They can become paranoid. Um, they actually start losing weight, even though they may be eating more, um, and they start losing muscle mass. Um, and it, it can actually, you know, be very detrimental to the human body. Uh, they've even done rat studies where they've um, kept rats awake um, anywhere from a couple of days up to, to 10, 11 days. And most, and if not all of them, um, animals perished um, due to lack of sleep. And what they found was that their immune system basically failed them and that they all died of sepsis. So um, getting plenty of sleep um, is very important. Um, and on that um, line of thinking, they've even done studies where they've um, looked at individuals who um, may not sleep, let's say seven, eight hours, maybe they they tend to sleep only five or six hours versus someone who sleeps seven, eight hours, and then they get their flu shot. Um, and then they look to see who builds a good immunity based on their flu shot. And um, it is documented that those who do not sleep um, sufficient hours do not build up a good immunity. So um, it's also, you know, understood that when you're sick, when you have the flu, if you're not feeling well, that you need to make sure that you get plenty of rest so that your body can repair itself. And that's also so that your immune system um, can help you feel better. 
Um, there's also other disorders that are tied into poor sleep or lack of sleep, um, diabetes, um, um, obesity, and those are even independent of each other. Um, and uh, there's also heart disease. Um, studies have shown that individuals who sleep six hours or less on a regular basis have an increased risk of um, death due to cardiovascular disease versus somebody who sleeps seven, eight hours. <laughs> So this um, slide is just showing some of those other statistics um, that one in 25 adults um, have fallen asleep at the wheel um, in let's say a one month period um, if they're sleeping um, you know, less than seven hours a night. Um, there's a 33% increase in risk of dementia um, due to lack of sleep that um, we actually can age our brains by three to five years um, beyond our actual chronological age if we're consistently depriving ourselves of sleep. Um, there's a three um, times a chance um, that you will catch a cold uh, if you're not sleeping enough. 50% um, increased risk of obesity um, if you're sleeping um, less than five hours a night. So here's a video which hopefully should translate over Zoom of an individual who um, pay attention, his head starts to kind of go back and you can tell his eyes actually start to close. Unfortunately, not able to recover, um, and he was not wearing a seatbelt. So this here was an example of what we call microsleep. So while he was awake, he actually had some intrusion of sleep. So that term that we refer to as the sleep pressure or sleep inertia, um, that because he was um, sleep deprived, that his brain was not able to keep the sleep out um, and that he had a moment or what we would refer to as like a blackout um, or a lapse in consciousness. And when you're driving 65 miles per hour um, in a matter of a second or two, you've gone the length of a football field. And so by the time you come back around and are focused if you're you know, trying to avoid an accident, it's not very likely that you'll be successful. <laughs> so driving drowsy um, is a pretty concerning statistic in the United States. And this is even data that's um, from back in 2006. Um, but essentially a crash occurs every 25 seconds um, due to individuals driving drowsy, an injury um, every minute, and a death occurs about every hour due to someone driving um, when they're tired. And if you stay awake for 17 to 19 hours straight, it's like having a blood alcohol content of 0.05. And if you're awake for 24 hours straight, um, you're, it's the equivalent of a blood alcohol content higher than the legal limit. So it's very important that you always make certain that you're you're getting sufficient sleep before you get behind the wheel. Um, there was actually a recent uh, patient of ours um, who uh, is a pilot and he flies for a commercial airline. And when COVID started, um, he was put on a like a call schedule and uh, he would commute from here to LAX. And essentially what had happened was on one of his drives home after his shift, he decided not to sleep in LA before driving home. And on two occasions, he actually had dozed off at the wheel while driving. Um, luckily he didn't get into an accident. <laughs> so how much sleep should we be getting? Um, and well, that varies across um, our lifespan. And um, the way that they've derived this information and in particular, mainly for adults uh, is there was a big consensus um, that was done a few years back with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the National Sleep Foundation and a few other um, larger um, colleges where they pulled the data that's out there on you know, PubMed and all the different um, research um, databases. And so they looked at studies that were comparing sleep with mortality, um, sleep hours with um, 
cardiovascular events like strokes, heart attacks, um, looking at studies where they would um, deprive individuals of sleep and then have them conduct certain tests or test their memory from something they learned um, the day before. And essentially what they found is that the optimal um, at least minimum amount of sleep for an adult is seven hours. And that if you're consistently sleeping less than seven hours per night, that it can be detrimental to your health. <laughs> and over the lifespan, um, the way our brain sleeps does change, unfortunately. And as you can see on the very left hand side is um, for infants and they, have a lot of slow wave or what we call deep sleep, which is the red, um, the red bubble. And then um, the purple, which is REM sleep as well, constitutes um, quite a bit of their sleep. But by the time you're in elementary school, your REM sleep diminishes quite a bit and then um, kind of stays fairly constant. Um, but because that deep sleep um, diminishes through um, the lifespan, and people tend to spend more time in that stage two and sleep kind of becomes a little more fragmented. Um, individuals start to sense that their quality of sleep is not as good. And so then they tend to stay in bed longer than they actually need trying to make up for what they feel is poor quality sleep. And then they develop more insomnia symptoms because they actually don't really need to be sleeping more but they are staying in bed longer than they should. <laughs> So I have 10 tips um, to help um, with sleep, um, especially as I mentioned during stressful times or if you're just struggling um, with your sleep in general. So as we discussed, a regular routine is very important and making sure that you have um, adequate time for seven hours um, per night. Um, but I will say that despite that recommendation, there are some people that just know that maybe they're six and a half hour sleepers. So kind of on that idea of, for example, this slide here where individuals might be spending more time in bed than they need. If you yourself are someone who doesn't really need to sleep seven hours, and if you try to sleep seven hours, then you're going to you know, create insomnia. So, so you have to kind of take that in the context of what is the optimal amount of sleep for yourself. Um, and if you are struggling with insomnia symptoms, it's very important to make sure that even on the weekends that you're staying on the same routine, because if you, let's say, decide to sleep in on Saturday and Sunday, um, then it's going to disrupt your sleep cycle um, for, you know, the following week. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of um, bedtime routine, as I mentioned, trying to avoid um, electronics at least 30 minutes prior to bedtime, if not starting around nine o'clock, depending on what time um, you typically get into bed. And then trying to have a routine that's soothing. Um, you know, obviously don't watch television or movies that might make you anxious or upset, um, you know, and do something that's relaxing. For some people it's reading, uh, maybe doing a crossword puzzle, um, you know, things like that. And then uh, again, the environment. So your room should be cool, dark, quiet. If you need to cover up some of those little, you know, cable box with that bright light, you know, put a little piece of tape over it. Um, make sure that your room is quiet and that the temperature is cool. Um, meals. So if um, you're eating too close to bedtime, um, your digestion um, can affect your sleep, especially if you have any um, acid reflux symptoms. Um, you should already be, you know, adhering to some behavioral changes with, you know, trying to avoid spicy meals and, you know, heavy, um, you know, fried foods and whatnot. So um, also fluid intake, especially as we get older, unfortunately, we start to have more bladder issues, um, both men and women. Um, and so trying to make sure that you hydrate yourself really well during the day so that come evening time, you're not trying to make up for not drinking enough during the day, which then if you drink close to bedtime, then you're gonna find you're waking up quite a bit during the night to have to avoid. Um, and then stimulants, as we mentioned, you know, nicotine, caffeine, um, try to um, refrain at least six hours prior to bedtime so that those substances are not um, interfering with your sleep. <laughs> also, um, the tip of don't toss and turn. So what that's referring to is if you can't sleep, um, one of the um, tips that we always recommend to our patients with insomnia is don't lie in bed awake. If you can't sleep, 
if you have that sense about you that you're just not going to go to sleep or it's been 20 minutes, then get out of bed, go to another room and do something relaxing. Then once you start to feel sleepy again, then try to put yourself back into bed. If as soon as you get into bed, you start to feel alert again and can't go back to sleep, then get out of bed. So kind of like that example of that patient who was sitting in her bedroom all day long uh, because she didn't want to you know, pay the cost of having to cool down her whole house. So she's sitting in her bed doing all these other activities. So um, that's creating that association of being alert and awake with the bed. So if you're having trouble sleeping, you're worried, your mind is um, wandering and you have, um, you know, all of those thoughts that are going on in your head, then get out of bed so that you don't create that association with being what we call hyper alert in your bed. And then that your bed um, should be kept for sleep and intimacy only. Um, and bright light in the morning is actually very helpful for setting your circadian rhythm for that night, the coming upcoming night. So when you get up in the morning, if you're able to get outside and we have that luxury with where we live, um, we tend to have sunny mornings almost every day of the year. So if you can get outside, um, typically we recommend not to wear um, sunglasses or a hat, but do protect your skin um, from the sun. Um, but by getting 30 minutes of bright light in the morning, that can help set your circadian rhythm for, for the following night. Um, exercise, as I mentioned, um, is very important. It helps to relieve stress and it helps to increase your sleep drive. Um, but you do want to be certain not to exercise right close to bedtime because there is a natural release of endorphins, which, you know, then will give you that natural high and then you'll um, have a difficult time going to sleep. So it's, it's better to exercise maybe in the um, early evening or earlier in the day. And then uh, we spoke about napping. So it's best to refrain from napping if you really don't have to, but if you do, then restrict it to 20 minutes. So it's just that quick um, cat nap that's refreshing um, that you don't want to get into that deep sleep or REM sleep um, because then you're going to use up that sleep drive um, for, your, for your nighttime sleep. Um, and also when you nap, if you have to, preferably in the first half of the day. So again, you're not um, using up some of that um, desire for sleep at night. Um, so how are we doing on time? We have about 20 minutes. Okay, so from here, I have um, some more slides just going over sleep disorders. And I don't know if at this point would be a good time to um, field some questions or if people want me to, to, to speak on any particular topic. So if you have a topic, or main topic, I'm sorry, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask the question, or you can use the um, reaction button and raise your hand and I can call on you as well. Marge, I see you unmuted. Are you have a question or a couple? I do. Um, I had a career in nursing. I worked the day shift. Started anywhere from six to seven in the morning. Uh, I'm not a napper. And seven years after retirement, my eyeballs pop open at four or five in the morning. I, I just don't know what to do. I mean, yeah, there's the newspaper and the puzzles, but it's really aggravating. Do you ever lose that circadian part of your rhythm? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess my question to you is what time are you naturally feeling sleepy and going to bed? Usually 8.30 to 9. 8.30 to 9? Yeah. So then you are getting essentially about seven hours of sleep. So, um, so it's not uncommon. That, um, as we get older, kind of similar to children where they tend to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier. So it's what we call an advanced um, sleep phase. Um, that, that, that's essentially what's happening. So um, you're getting sufficient sleep and you're getting your seven, eight hours. Um, it's just that it's shifted. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you find a lot of distress with waking up that early and you're not wanting to start your day at that time, um, then what you could do is you could uh, do some bright light therapy in the evening to try to delay your sleep so that then you're, you know, maybe going to bed at 10 o'clock at night so that then you'll, you know, sleep till, you know, maybe five or 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's just the natural 
circadian shift that occurs. And for some people, it's much stronger than others, uh, where when they kind of get to a certain age that they tend to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier. That was my life, you know, and now there's no friends that I have that want to go anywhere at five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> not even a walk, not even anything. So yeah, it, uh, I mean, it's okay. It's just sort of, I do feel like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think you're alone. I, I, I mean, I encounter a, a lot of patients that come through our clinic that um, tend to sleep around eight, eight thirty. They get up at four in the morning and they start their day. So, That's it. yeah, but it, you know, the bright light can help. You can do that in the evening time, 30 minutes. Um, so for bright light therapy, um, there are some products you can search online, um, but you do want to check with your eye doctor, make sure that you don't have any issues with your um, retina. And then when you do the bright light therapy, you kind of look into it indirectly um, for 30 minutes and it can help, um, you know, keep you awake and delay that desire to sleep so early. Thank you. Another question. Love questions. Uh, I've been, uh, I had, I've had trouble falling asleep since I was very young. And over the years, I developed the habit of just being able to stay up later and later. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that I would go to bed about four o'clock in the morning. And with this pandemic time, it's just gotten worse. And I tend to go to bed about six now. And okay. So uh -huh. it's really difficult. And I just have a really hard time to change that pattern because mm -hmm. it's so ingrained and it's just really diff difficult. So I'll, uh, I'm wondering, first of all, is, is there any, any hope to be able to change that? Because I think it's going to take a lot of work that I'm not sure I'm able to do. And the other thing, question I had was regarding um, the, sleep, the sleep tests, that you, the polysamnogram. Mm -hmm. I, I feel it's much closer to the cartoon that you showed. First, <laughs> uh, having I've gone through two of them, and um, my current mental health therapist is suggesting I do it again. The okay. last, the last one I had done, what done was in 2012, mm -hmm. saying things like, "Well, there's there's new technologies and new things to learn," and I don't feel that there's any value to it because it it doesn't really tell me anything. I, I, Currently, my primary problem is simply getting to bed. Yeah. It's not, I do sleep okay once I finally do it, and mm -hmm. I'm doing melatonin and things to. Okay. So, me. so when you said that you, you go to bed around six in the morning, then you sleep kind of similar to Marge. You're just. Yeah, I'm, I'm the opposite of Marge. So you're the, you're <laughs> delayed. You're, you're the night owl. So, yeah. and you, once you go to, you have, once you go to sleep. So if you try to go to sleep at six, you're okay. You're, you're not having insomnia at that point. Generally. It and then you sleep there. seven. Yeah. I sleep. Hours. I usually get up around one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so kind of, yeah. So it's just the opposite. Um, and in order to shift your sleep, what you would do is um, you would maybe let's say each week, like you could say every Sunday, you're going to set your alarm to wake up 30 minutes, or you can even do 15 minutes. And so like, if you're waking up at one in the afternoon, then let's say starting next, this coming Sunday, you're going to get up at, um, so if you're getting up at 1 p.m., then let's say now you're going to get up at 1245. And then the next week you'll get up at 1230 and then 1215. So you'll focus on shifting your wake up time by 15 minutes every week and do that, you know, for that whole week. And then the next week shift it. And then don't. Um, uh, so, so your nighttime really should be um, based on your cue to go to sleep. So don't try to force yourself to go to bed early. So go to bed when you feel like you're ready to initiate sleep. Um, and you can take melatonin up to two hours prior to what you think would be your intended bedtime. Mm. And that can help support your circadian rhythm too. So it'd be a very slow shift. And then when you get up in the morning, you know, do the bright light therapy, um, in the morning, make sure you're exercising, you know, be mindful of the stimulants and alcohol and whatnot. Yeah, and so you, you can, you can start to shift your sleep. Um, in terms of the sleep studies, um, Yes, definitely. There's not a whole lot of change in technology with what we're doing in terms of that sleep study itself. But in 
probably what your therapist was referring to is, for example, if let's say you have sleep apnea, there is, you know, newer technology from that perspective. So I don't know if that's what that your, your therapist I, was referring to. I don't, you know, I don't know what she was referring to, but neither of my previous tests showed any evidence of apnea and I don't yeah. feel that that's there. So, yeah. so for can... someone like you who has a um, sleep schedule that's um, sort of outside of the norm of how we would do a sleep study in the lab, you know, because we operate during certain hours and you're pretty much going to bed when we would finish a sleep study. So, so uh, if someone was concerned about sleep apnea in your case, then maybe a home sleep test might work better, um, at least to just make sure that that component is not involved in what's going on but it sounds mostly like to me that you have a delayed sleep phase yeah i, I agree with that Thanks, and and do you know anything about uh the new trend on weighted blankets um you know i think they can be helpful i don't know that there's necessarily anything proven scientifically but you know certain you know um tactics like the weighted blankets um white noise um there's even cooling headbands can help. Um, there's the theory of um, cooling down the frontal lobe helps you get into deep sleep and maintain deep sleep. So some of these things, you know, can work. Um, Thank you. So we have a couple, uh, and we'll jump right back to Charles in just one sec here. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, basically, they're kind of generally related to uh, use of Ambien to help uh -huh. you sleep, and okay. as well uh, CBD you know, for sleep. So they're basically, you know, what kind of things can work along with melatonin? Okay. So the Ambien, which is classified as a um, hypnotic, is okay to use temporarily for what we would call acute insomnia. Um, basically, if someone is going through uh, transition, grieving, maybe, you know, starting a new job. So temporarily for a week or two, um, it would be acceptable, but it's, when the medication first came out though, unfortunately it was branded as basically the cure-all for insomnia and that it could be used long-term indefinitely, but that's not the case anymore. But there are a lot of people though that are still on it um, that probably were put on it back in those days um, and it works for them. Um, but the concern is that um, being the medication that it is for some people, um, they do develop a, um, a dependence on it. Um, they may even develop a tolerance to it where maybe the lower dose they're taking is not working anymore and now they need a higher dose. Um, and there is also concern um, with long-term use um, with um, Ambien or similar medications that uh, it could um, correlate with cognitive decline um, years down the line. Um, you know, essentially association with dementia. Um, so I personally do not prescribe that medication newly to somebody. Obviously, if someone's already on it, depending on the situation, we may continue with it. Um, but typically, I try to wean patients off and try um, either doing cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Um, again, that kind of theory of trying to restructure how their brain is associating with their bed. Um, or trying um, a, a different approach with medications that are not technically sleep aids, but have a sedating effect that can help with sleep. And so the CBD, unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of scientific data to guide us. Um, we don't really have a dosing guide and, you know, these um, uh, I'm not sure what, you know, these stores where you can go buy them, you know, there's so much variability in how they um, make their product and the dosing in it that it's difficult for us as clinicians to recommend a particular brand or, you know, what to do. Um, but I see a lot of patients who come to me who've tried it and some that do stay on it for quite a while, but I'll admit, I don't think that I've ever seen it be the answer um, that, people are looking for and that maybe temporarily it gave them some benefit or relief from their insomnia but I, I have yet to see someone say that it fixes their insomnia and you know because then otherwise why would they be coming in <laughs> to see me so um, it, it doesn't seem to necessarily be a um, permanent fix. I have a question. Yes, yes go ahead. 
Uh, I have a CPAP, mm -hmm. I'm on CPAP with oxygen. Um, one of the problems that I have is if I go to bed at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, I have to, I get up and I may go in and eat some watermelon, go back to bed two, three hours later, I'm going back up again, getting something to eat, small, and back to bed. And this is continuous, sometimes three times, sometimes four times a night. So it's mm -hmm. breaking up my sleep pattern. Yeah, I, you know, so if someone like yourself, it sounds like it would be worthwhile. I mean, we would essentially really evaluate your sleep pattern, maybe have you do a sleep diary. Um, we would evaluate your um, CPAP therapy, depending on how old your machine is, if we're able to retrieve data off of it. Everything is, uh, a year ago, they did a sleep study, which made me bring in the oxygen. And then um, they've evaluated the oxygen within the last year. Mm -hmm. So it's all, you know, I don't know. It's it's a pulmonary doctor who's done all that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, it's kind of difficult to say exactly. You know, we'll just right. do this and it'll fix it. It sounds like your situation is definitely a little bit more complicated. Um, but essentially, what we would do is really try to evaluate your sleep pattern, see if maybe through cognitive behavioral therapy we could help restructure your sleep pattern to try to eliminate some of those awakenings. You know, obviously, make sure that your um, CPAP therapy and oxygen therapy that everything is optimal, um, and uh, and then whether or not maybe some medication might be beneficial. Okay, is this the type thing? In other words, when I go to my doctor. Is this the type thing that I make a recommendation to say, I'd like to go see a sleep, are you considered a sleep study specialist? Or is that what yeah, you're- Right, well, essentially a sleep specialist. Um, so, and, and you don't um, have to even get a referral from your doctor. Um, for example, I basically uh, see patients with all insurances except for HMOs and HMOs are usually the only oh, ones that really- Okay. That, yeah, that require a referral. So you can technically refer yourself. Um, okay. But yes, yeah, so you essentially, if you wanted to talk to your primary care doctor first, just to see whether or not he or she could help you themselves um, first, um, otherwise, you know, for them to say yes, you know, go see a specialist. Okay, special sleep specialist. Mm -hmm. Considered. Okay. Right. Great. I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one was pretty easy. He said, can you catch up with sleep the next day if you sleep more than, can you catch up with sleep the next day if you sleep more one day? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think if I understand it correctly, you know, for example, I'm assuming if someone was sleep deprived, maybe only got four or five hours of sleep when they're used to normally sleeping seven hours. Um, it may take a couple of days to make up for the, the sleep that you lost. Um, and it really depends on the individual. Um, some people um, you know, might sleep a couple of extra hours longer the next day and then wake up and feel refreshed and then feel like now they're back on track. Um, so it, it just kind of depends. And another one, which uh, I think I'm fall prey to says, what impact if any does sleeping with a partner or spouse in the same bed or allowing pets to sleep with you impact the quality of one's sleep? Um, okay, so it obviously depends on whether or not the bed partner or the pets are disrupting your sleep. So obviously, if your bed partner um, is snoring and waking you up, then that's, of course, disruptive, or they come to bed later than you do, and then the process of them getting into bed wakes you up, um, or if they wake up earlier than you do, and then uh, you, then you have a hard time going back to sleep because they will get you up to get ready for their day. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, um, our spouses can sometimes um, uh, be a nuisance. Uh, so I guess the question is, is how can they do things in a manner not to disrupt us um, or whether or not wearing eye shades and earplugs um, can make it easier for us not to be um, disrupted by them. Um, or if they have, let's say, you know, snoring, then maybe they need to get tested for sleep apnea. Um, and then pets um, in the same respect. Um, I, I think it's not bad if your pet sleeps in the bed with you, but if they're waking you up um, or they're, you know, 
trying to get your attention so that you can take them out so they can go to the bathroom, then, you know, obviously those are uh, points at which then, you know, they're disrupting your sleep. So then it's trying to, um, you know, figure out how to work around that. Yeah, usually it's that kicking you out of bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even if your dog is only seven pounds and, you know, <laughs> they're pushing you over to the other side. <laughs> So, but Andrew was, um, made a comment over here too that um, he's been using an edible product for quite a while that's a combination of melatonin and THC and finding it useful when using a small, um, small edible. So that's what, what he's been using that. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah, so for some people, um, you know, obviously it has the melatonin in it, so that can be helpful. Um, uh, I don't know that the THC so much component. I know the CBD or, you know, the indica can be helpful for sleep. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously if, if, you know, Andrew, you feel that your sleep is, you know, restorative and this is working well for you, then um, that's great. Um, you know, obviously these products would not be recommended um, in children because their brain is still developing and growing. And so, um, you know, the, the THC CBD products, you know, really are more intended for, you know, those in their 20s and beyond. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to mention it in response to the CBD question that there, there, there's other options too that I, at least I have found useful. Yeah, you mean in terms of like the tinctures and the edibles and? Well, I'm just saying I have found a, a, an edible that I find useful. It it's th has THC as opposed. And I don't know. It may have some CBD, but it's primarily mm -hmm. THC with the melatonin as as opposed to the mm -hmm. CBD product. And I I don't mm -hmm. know I don't know how CBD edibles would would work in terms of sleep issues. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, that's interesting. I guess the question is, um, have you tried just melatonin by itself? And I wonder if maybe it's really the melatonin that's being helpful and not necessarily the THC. Uh, I, I, not really, I, but I, I do think there's some benefit in the, in the THC in, in, in terms of how I feel in, in getting mm -hmm. sleep and such. So it's for me, for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of individual. Yeah. Did anyone have any other questions? Uh, like, wait, wait. I see Blaine. a hand up. If you want to unmute yourself, Blaine, or there okay, we there we go. Um, I have a question. We got Blaine first. Go ahead, Blaine. Okay. Um, so I have had trouble with sleep for a very for quite a while, um, and since 2006, I have had to take trazodone every night for sleep. And that gets me about six hours of sleep. Um, but there have been a couple of times where I couldn't take it. And I was up for 39 hours, still wide awake. Um, have I developed a um, sort of like an addiction to the trazodone? Uh, I mean, that's interesting because technically they say, so the trazodone is in the drug class of what we would call a sedating antidepressant. Um, so it's not a sedative hypnotic. Um, so technically it's not habit. Um, but okay. those medications, since they're in the drug class of an antidepressant, if you stop them cold turkey, you can sometimes get rebound symptoms. So for someone, let's say, who has anxiety and they're taking the medication and then they stop it suddenly, you know, they can get panic attacks. So um, with this medication, since it helps with sleep, um, then, you know, stopping it abruptly like that could then cause like a rebound. So it might have been more of that phenomenon than it is you, you know, being dependent on it. Because I know I cannot sleep unless I take it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for some people that medication, you know, can work well um, for insomnia. Okay. Uh, but I would say in terms of determining whether or not you're really dependent on it, um, I guess you'd have to wean off of it very slowly so that you're not having a rebound effect to then say that you, you know, can't sleep without it. Question. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Can you speak on the management of those um, 
of snoring and sleep apnea? Uh, so snoring can be a sign of sleep apnea, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have sleep apnea. Um, there's the phrase that um, not all snoring is sleep apnea and you don't have to snore to have sleep apnea. So with um, out doing a sleep study, you don't necessarily know for certain what you're dealing with, but there's probably a good chance that it is um, sleep apnea. And um, so if you do a sleep study and confirm that it's there, and let's see, I can share my screen. Do you do a lot of oral appliances for uh, the uh, management of both? Yeah, well, I personally don't. Let me um, go to over here. Can you guys see this? Are you guys seeing my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. So. So there's obviously the CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. Um, and there are many types of masks and I refer all of them at, to as masks. So um, there are what we call nasal pillows, um, nasal masks, full face masks. So these two pictures are, are depicting actually um, this one here, a nasal mask, and this other one here, it's a little hard to tell, but it's a nasal pillow. So this is with the machine creating the pressure to keep the airway open. Um, but um, there are some other types of more creative masks that if someone does tolerate the standard type of mask, um, that these could possibly be options if someone really can't have headgear around their face head, and neck. Um, but then some alternative treatments are, as you were referring to, the oral appliance. And so this is done through a dentist um, where you have, um, you know, preferably done through a dentist. Because you can get some of these over the counter, um, but it's better to do it with somebody who, who knows what they're doing. Um, and so they, you know, take impressions of your teeth and then um, you have this device fabricated and there's some sort of component here on the side, as you can see here, or sometimes there might be a locking mechanism in the front that when you close your mouth, um, it brings your bottom jaw forward to help create more space for your tongue so that your tongue is not crowding in the back of your throat. Um, and it helps to open up um, your breathing in the back of your throat. Are, you speaking, of, are you speaking of mandibular repositioning appliances? Yeah, so that's another term. Um, there are also what we call tongue stabilizers, which I don't know if I have a picture. I don't. Um, the tongue stabilizers, it literally is like a little suction um, that you put your tongue in like little silicone pads, and then it has two little components that um, sort of keep it um, up in front of your teeth. Um, so by keeping the tongue out of the way, um, and that you can get over the counter, you can purchase um, online. Um, there's um, a newer um, approach. Um, I would say this has been around now for about seven years. Um, it's really more as an alternative um, CPAP if somebody has tried CPAP and, and just cannot tolerate the therapy. Um, and this is technically a surgical procedure, so it's reserved more for severe, like uh, upper limits of moderate to severe sleep apnea. Um, and it, it's kind of similar to like having a pacemaker. Um, so you'll have this little device implanted in your chest wall right under the muscle. Um, and then you have an external device that when you, um, uh, go to bed at night, you turn it on, and then through this little green wire, um, which is sitting in your chest wall, it senses when you're breathing, and then it sends a signal to the, um, the nerve that controls your tongue. And so as you breathe in, it makes your tongue move out of the way. Um, so it kind of is on the lines of like the mandibular um, advancement devices or the tongue stabilizers. Mm -hmm. um, and this here is showing um, in, in the left hand side, it's somebody who does not have the um, nerve stimulator. And you can see here the airway is very small um, and the palate is crowding the airway with the stimulator. And by moving the tongue out of the way, you can see more air space and you can see, appreciate here um, that the um, 
that you can actually see the person's airway and that they can breathe. So um, this can work in a certain set of individuals. Um, they're very particular about evaluating patients to make sure that they are good candidates and that they'll have success with the treatment. Um, Unfortunately, I don't think that there's anyone here in our valley that's doing these. So um, you would have to go to a larger university center um, like UCLA or USC. Great. Well, thank you for answering all those. So we're a little we're over time. So I do want to thank you and thank everybody for participating and hanging in there. What a um, very informative. Um, I've learned more things myself <laughs> every time. Uh, and I think anything else from your side, Candace? we adjourn? No, nothing here. Just thank you so much. Uh, it was very informative. And um, so it's a very large crowd. So sleep definitely seems to be an issue. So uh, so we'll keep that in mind as we're planning um, future programs that, uh, that sleep is definitely something that affects us all in one way or another. So we'll keep those in Absolutely. mind and doing some other ones as we move forward. So thank you all very much for participating tonight. I hope you got a lot of good out of it and it was worth your time and energy. It felt certainly felt like it. And thank you so much, doctor, for your participation tonight. Of thank course. You.